I am Jamie. I'm the team lead for the Bionic Tigers, and I was a Dean's List finalist for the 2024 competition. Hi, my name is Malia. I'm, an, I'm a member of our programming team, and I'm also our junior team lead. Um, my name's Alex. I'm the programming lead. And I'm Grant. I'm the build lead, and I'll be monitoring some of the chats and pointing out some of the questions. Awesome. Uh, so we're just going to start with a little bit of information about our team. As I said, we are the Bionic Tigers. This is our 10th year in FTC, so we've been around the block a time or two. Uh, we have nine members this year, past few seasons. Uh, last year, we won the Think Award at the Ohio State Championship. And in 2021-2022 season, Freight Frenzy, we won the Inspire Award in Kentucky uh, for their state championship, as well as the Think Award at the Ohio Championship. Uh, we have won every judged award in our past. We qualified for Worlds three consecutive years, and we were named an Ohio Showcase team for seven years in a row. Um, these workshops are something that we run to kind of give uh, everyone, rookie teams and in incoming uh, FTC members, a chance to kind of learn what we've learned through experience, uh, give them a bit of a jump start so you can spend more time doing the fun stuff, you know, building robots, actually doing outreach, working toward those awards, just give you some tips and tricks from our experience, and we have plenty of it. Uh, today's workshop is, as I said, how to do FTC outreach. Uh, for our upcoming workshops, which some of you are signed up for, we have our Build and Robot Control Basics on July 10th, uh, Awards and Team Basics on July 31st, and our programming in Kotlin workshop will be on August 7th. Today, uh, we've got a few subcategories for what we're covering. So our general outreach information, what does that look like? What are you actually doing? A uh, couple of different categories of outreach. So the community outreach, professional outreach, and first outreach. And then a little bit about sponsorship and how that works. Now we'll be talking about general outreach information and just as a note, we consider outreach as part of our business team. So what exactly counts as business? Business is a really, really important aspect of FTC and it may reach, it may be like more important than you initially realize it is. Business can cover a lot of bases such as planning outreach with sponsors, communities, other FTC teams or first teams, et cetera documenting outreach events team and team accomplishments for your portfolio finding finding and contacting um sponsors whether they be monetary providing information for you or providing resources for you Main and maintaining a team brand and image is really important. It's what makes your team recognizable and memorable. So um, the business team for us, we, uh, we focus a lot on team branding and marketing ourselves. Managing social media. Social media is a really great way to outreach with other FTC, FTC teams and spread awareness about FTC. So our business team works on managing social media. And of course, our business team handles emails. Emails kind of are involved with all of the above and they're a really important conduit for information. So the business workload, business work is shared by the whole team and it's not just placed on the business sub team. All team members should help with doc outreach documentation. All team members should be participating in outreach. So of course, everyone's going to be responsible for helping with outreach documentation. And individual sub teams in the portfolio are responsible for documenting their work. The whole team should participate in outreach events, as I mentioned earlier, and those individual sub teams are responsive are responsible for their respective section of the portfolio. So the build team should be writing the build stuff. The programming team should write, be writing the programming stuff and the business team will be writing the business stuff. But each section can kind of help each other by um, reading over um, like grammar checking, spell checking, all that stuff and just giving feedback. So documentation is very, very important for awards. It's okay to boast about your stats here. This is where you're kind of marketing yourself to the judges. You're doing all this amazing work. So you may as well kind of like document it. So some important things to note to have for your documentation outreach. If you want to see on the right there, there's a little example of what our document our outreach documentation pages look like. Always include the date and name of the event. 
include numbers. This can be something like people reached, how many hours your team spent going to this outreach event, et cetera. Judges love to see numbers and stats on anything. So including those in any way is just a really way, great way to get the judges engaged and to get an idea of the scope of the event. And scope of the event, also talk about the impact of the event. What is your community going to be like now after the event? How are you inspiring people to go learn about first stuff? This is, again, this is a great way to boast about yourself. You're doing amazing things and you're inspiring people. So you should be bragging about it. Always be detailed and thorough, be detailed and thorough for judges. Also include pictures to further drive home your point and just kind of show the judges what the event was like. And you can also have contacts to verify this information and testify uh, to the team. And always, um, as always, just check your grammar, check your um, spelling, all that good stuff. And question break, does anyone have any questions? You can type in the chat or you can ask out loud. Hey, can you explain a little bit about some of the things that when you say include contacts, these are people who can verify the activity that you participated in, or are there other things that that can include? Pretty much just people who can verify um, like the activity you participated in. This could be like an event, like the person who organized the event you're at or something like that. We have a, a raised hand up there. Um, go ahead and ask whatever it was you wanted to ask. How many members are on the team? Our team currently has nine members. Just to add to what Malia said about the contacts, um, the sheet they were showing as an example is kind of what we keep for our own records throughout the season and then at the end in the portfolio because your pages are limited they kind of do a summary of all the outreach things so some of the contact is for your own records to continue to reach out to people if you want to do that event again in the future or maybe expand on it or something like that too someone posted a question in the chat on what's more important about the documentation of the outreach or is it the actual outreach itself which is more important I, um, I would say yeah. that neither is more important than the other. They go very much hand in hand. Obviously, you have to do the outreach in order to be able to document it. But in order to get as much benefit out of that as you can, uh, both in the team going forward and in the judging room, you do have to have that documentation. So it's very clear what it is that you're doing and how many people you're reaching and you know how much time you're spending on outreach. So in... Obviously, like I said, doing the outreach is the first step and the documentation is the second step. Uh, you really can't do one without the other, or at least both would have less impact without the other. So I you re I'd re that's that's basically uh, my opinion there is you really can't separate them. Uh, in order to document outreach, you have to do outreach and in order to get credit for your outreach and have as much positive benefit as you can, and you have to document. we have any other questions? Yes, I'm new to this whole thing. And um, first first year starting in August and um, just wonder what is the outreach exactly? Uh, so outreach, we've got uh, several sections coming up about uh, what the different types of outreach are as we sort them and how to do each of them. Uh, but outreach as a general definition is going outside of your team to interact in a way that either spreads robotics or that allows your team to learn new skills that you can apply uh, within your team. And is it a requirement or is it something that is just optional if you want to win these awards? It's not technically a requirement to compete. Uh, however, you, as you said, you will not win any, uh, there are several outreach based awards um, which obviously must have outreach to do and just generally it improves your team a lot when you do outreach it's a great way to learn new skills and to kind of establish your team as a presence um so like i said not technically required 
but I would personally highly recommend it, uh, and I, I would say that most people in first would also highly recommend it. Okay, thank you. All right, well, if that's all of our questions, uh, then we will go ahead and move on to our different types of outreach. As I said earlier, we divide our outreach into three categories, which are community outreach, professional outreach, and first outreach. So we're gonna start with community outreach. Um, you can see that we have a couple of pictures of us doing various community outreach events. So we're gonna start with just an overview of kind of what that is. So community outreach is uh, any event where you are interacting not with professionals or other people in first, but with people like on the side there, you're at your school, your local community, specific groups within your community, just the general population of your area and perhaps beyond your area, uh, but not anyone who's involved with robotics or in uh, manufacturing and engineering industry. Uh, so a great way to do that, uh, if you don't have a whole lot of resources yet, is to look for opportunities to be a part of existing events, such as if you're affiliated with a school, you can go to host events like a science day, uh, any, any event where the students are learning about science and STEM, or open houses, club fairs, any, any place where the school is hosting a chance for clubs or teams or local groups to kind of show off what they're doing. Or uh, the general community, the city or town that you're in might host fairs, festivals, or sort of a recurring event like a farmer's market. I know we in Loveland have a farmer's market that happens uh, every week during the summer. We were actually there yesterday. So that's always a great one. Uh, or you can host your own events. And on the next slide, we're going to have some kind of criteria for how you do that. So when you're hosting events, there are a couple of things you want to consider. Uh, first, what is it that you can share with or teach somebody? So some examples of that might be STEM or business skills that you have, uh, CAD, which is computer-aided design, programming, marketing, anything that you have learned through robotics or that your team generally has as a skill that you can teach to other people. Uh, general STEM-related activities like 3D printing or scout badges, uh, like we do a Girl Scout workshop uh, several a year or even Cub Scouts, uh, if either of those groups exist in your area. And then programming Lego robots, if you have FLL teams nearby or at least access to FLL resources, that can be a great thing for especially younger kids to kind of get into the world of robotics. And then you can kind of show off your chops with robot demonstrations or driving, uh, show off your competition robot if you have one or example robots that members of your community could drive. And then the other thing you want to think about is who is it that you can teach? Are you attempting to market to your peers, so people around your same age group, uh, younger people, in order to build interest in STEM, kind of get them into robotics younger, and maybe move up the pipeline? I know that a lot of our community outreach to younger people has led to them joining FLL and eventually FTC, so you can kind of work toward your own sustainability. While doing that, it helps a lot with keeping your team running over a course of years. There's a reason we've made it to 10 years and community outreach is a huge part of that, or just your general community in order to reach out to adults, uh, just generally people in your area in order to build more of a presence, get people to kind of know who you are, and perhaps even secure sponsorships as we'll go into later in the presentation. So when you're planning an event, uh, you've got to think about who's your audience, you know, because a science-based event intended for sixth graders is going to look very different than a scouting or other event for second graders, uh, which for our international folks is like 11 and 12 year olds versus uh, like seven, eight year olds, because those two groups of people are going to have very different levels of expertise and ability to understand. Uh, you're going to also want to have an idea of how many people are going to be attending in order to, you know, do all of that planning, because when you're choosing an appropriate location, you want to have a space that's going to fit all of your folks, all of the team members, and all of the guests or visitors comfortably without having so much space that it seems like you're in a cavern and you don't know what to do with it all. And then when you're bringing your resources, you want to make sure you have enough for every person 
plus a little bit of extra in case something breaks or uh, you need a little, just a little bit extra, you get more people than you think you would. But you don't want to have a ton of extra resources because then you're wasting your budget on stuff that you didn't need. Uh, so you want to have like some example stuff is if you're running an activity, you're obviously going to need enough supplies for that. Uh, computers, make sure that those are fully charged and have extras in case that they are, in case they aren't have chargers, all of that fun stuff. Uh, flyers about your team, whatever it is that you want to put on there, your local robotics program, any information that people who might want to sponsor you would need. Uh, general information about first, whatever it is that you are trying to promote at that particular event. And then batteries for robots, because those batteries will die faster than you think they will. And you want to make sure that your robots are running the entire time. So we've got some examples here of events that we do. Uh, we are affiliated with our local school districts. So we do a lot of events at the school uh, that they are doing and we're designing activities for. So Science Day uh, through all of the younger grades. Um, so it's just a day that our school hosts. It's all about STEM and science and various applications thereof. So we will design robotics activities for that. Or our school showcase night, which is essentially the big old uh, showcase for community groups affiliated with the school, um, clubs, groups, various different things to kind of show off what it is that they've been doing and tell people why they should join. Uh, scout workshops are also a big one for us in particular. So we do Girl Scout robotics badges. And then this past summer, we ran an event for a Cub Scout troop for the Nova Award, which is their version of a robotics badge, or just general STEM workshops in person or online over CAD basics and 3D printing, stuff that we are creating and hosting all on our own to teach people some skills. And then we also do some events just out in our local community. As I said, we were at a farmer's market yesterday. That's one that we do every year. Um, American Independence Day on July 4th is one that we also do every year. There's a festival in our city that we always go to. And then the homecoming parade, uh, we set up a float. We throw some candies to kids. It's, it's a great time for everyone involved. Uh, now, the Girl Scout event, uh, as I said, is one that we do several times a year. We've been doing it for eight years. It's a great way for us to get more girls and women interested in STEM. And a few of our team members have passed through that program and are now on the team or have been in the past. So it is a great way to get people into STEM and get them to stay there. Uh, step one for running an event like this is that you're going to want to research your badge requirements. So you got to decide what age group you're running an event for, because uh, in various areas, Girl Scouts or Girl Guides are divided into different age groups. So you have to make sure you have the right badge requirements. And then you do have to, to purchase a packet with those requirements from the Girl Scout shop website. Uh, they are not uh, publicly available. You do have to buy them, but they're only like $6. So if you're looking for a, a cheap activity to run, that's a great one. Um, you got to also plan an agenda for your event. That's step two. Uh, each badge has various steps. It's five steps per badge. And each of those has to be met. Each of those requirements has to be met with an activity. So you have to make sure you are planning activities that cover all of those different steps. And then determine what materials you need for those uh, different activities that you're planning versus what you have. Uh, it's always great to try and use as much of what you have as you possibly can. Um, given that you don't want to uh, buy new stuff if you don't have to. Uh, step three would be to ensure that you have space. If you're affiliated with a school, uh, you can host at your school. Um, if not, then you have to make sure you have a space that'll fit your entire group and all the materials that you need. And then step four is advertising. Uh, make sure that your advertising materials are both visually appealing and they draw people in and informative. You have to make sure that they've got dates, times, locations on them, all the things that people need to know in order to sign up uh, because there's you're not getting anywhere if you're not advertising appropriately and you want to make sure that people are coming to your event. And then for advertising, social media is a super valuable tool. You want to make sure that you're using that to your full advantage, build up your social media presence, and that is a great way to advertise for any event. Uh, I would also recommend if you have a local Girl Scout council 
connecting with them and they are able to promote your events on all of their various socials and that is an awesome way to get a little bit more publicity we have a question from someone in the chat of why do you need to purchase the packet from girl scout shop uh because it's it's a girl scout owned material um therefore in order to legally have it it must be purchased uh from somewhere uh that's why we don't have just the requirements posted uh, because legally you do have to purchase them from the group that owns the rights. So that is that is just where it's available. Uh, so this is a sample agenda based on what we do at our events. So badge one is programming robots and just the basic steps that you need to go through for that are you have to make sure that you introduce the concept and various uses of programming. Uh, briefly explain some related concepts, algorithms, different programming languages, uh, debugging, testing, any of those fun things that you do when you're programming. And then give the girls a chance to program some simple robots. Uh, so we generally use um, NXTs, which are an old uh, version of FLO robots that we have from many, many years ago um, that are a little bit simpler to work with. Uh, badge two is designing robots. So the you're, for that, you're going to want to explore some real world uses of robots using examples of robots that are really out there in companies being used in manufacturing, whatever it is, just make sure you have some examples. Uh, teach about basic design, uh, talk about, you know, a little bit about simple machines and how they're used and just generally basic design principles. And then allow girls to design their own robot uh, using basic materials. I think a lot of ours involve paper and cardboard and popsicle sticks uh, for a robot or for a purpose that they choose. Um, it's really interesting to see some of the purposes that the Girl Scouts choose. Uh, and then badge three is showcasing robots. So have the girls share their robots with one another and kind of discuss their design process. How did they come to their final design? Uh, what is it that they did? All of that fun stuff. And then take the opportunity to, take the opportunity to educate about competitive robotics, about FIRST, show some examples of robots competing. Uh, just generally kind of give them an idea of what it is that you do on your team. And I believe we have a question break after this slide. Yep, so we have any questions, uh, you can say them out loud or put them in the chat and, and we will answer them for you. There is one question, or there's a few questions in the chat. The, start with the first one. Do you use your robot or spike Lego kit to do the badge? Uh, neither of those. Um, so we do use, like I said, kind of an older uh, FLL technology, uh, which is a little outdated and you cannot actually purchase anymore unless someone's selling it on eBay or something. Um, but no, we use some very old FLL robots that we have. Um, but yeah, definitely don't use an FTC style robot for programming or any, any of those events. Um, it will be a little too complex for people who are kind of just breaking the water of robotics and everything you can do with it. But if you have access to a spike Lego kit, that yes, spikes is would be great, absolutely. Team. And you guys do show your robot to the girls too. At the end, is kind of a demonstration of where can you go with this. Mm -hmm. All right. Next one is how do you divide up on who goes to outreach events? Completely even, or contribute, or do some team members contribute more than others? Uh, so that's going to depend mostly on availability. Uh, everyone goes to all the outreach events that they can. Um, you know, our team all does a lot of various things uh, throughout every season. So people go to, like I said, as many as they can. Um, you know, obviously it's not going to be perfectly even because everyone has different availability. Some events take longer than others. Some just, you know, more people will go to. So, you know, it's not like we all have an even 96 hours every year um but it's um roughly close to even most years you know everyone's trying to put in as much time as they have 
And then another one is, do you need to do new outreach events every year? Or can you uh, continually keep up with events? Uh, both are good. Keeping a long running program like our Girl Scout workshops or like these online uh, FTC workshops is always a great thing uh, because you are pretty much guaranteed participation uh, if you've got it you know, set up and established because people will have heard about it and they want to keep doing it. Uh, but specifically for the judging room, they like to hear about new stuff that you're doing. So uh, if you have, you know, established programs, change them up a little bit every year, add something new and, you know, set up some new events. And then for coming up with those, um, there are several ways you can do that. You can look out in your community for events that are going on that you can run activities at. Um, essentially, it, it all comes down to finding a need or a desire uh, somewhere in your community for STEM education and figuring out a way that you as a team can fill that. Kind of building on that, Jamie, do you want to talk about how, since we've been out in the community for long enough, that events start to reach out to us? Like yeah, for sure. Um, we get a lot of emails about uh, various events. Um, like that Boy Scout event I mentioned we ran with the, the Cub Scouts this past summer. Um, our Girl Scout event has been around long enough that we actually were reached out to by a Cub Scout troop who was interested in earning their Nova badge and wanted to know if we could help them. Or I think we ran a daddy-daughter event. Uh, I forget exactly where, um, but a little bit further away from here um, because we are sort of the, the only people running Girl Scout robotics events uh, in our area. Um, so we, yeah, we got reached out to by them and we went up there, ran an event for them. It was a very good time. But yeah, once you get established in your community um, as a team or with a specific event, your name kind of gets out there and people will find you and give you opportunities to come present to them. Um, we're also, there's going to be a first outreach section later in the presentation, but I'm going to steal a little bit from that is as you grow your network of teams, they might reach out to you to do collaborative events. Um, like we host a first kickoff event every year for FTC. Uh, and this year we are uh, working with another Ohio FTC team to do that. So yeah, reach out, you know, the first few years you're going to have to do the legwork, but once you get established, people will find you. I mean, one last question is how do you motivate people to do stuff in the off season and to be more involved? That's an interesting question. Um, Honestly, I don't think we've typically had a problem with that. Uh, we do go down, uh, we have fewer meetings each week. We have two instead of our usual three. Um, but generally, FTC is a very large time commitment. I'm not going to uh, try and sugarcoat that. Um, but people are making that time commitment because they want to do it. Um Honestly, I this is uh I hope I'm not like completely blowing off your question here, but generally, you know, you just find find ways to make it fun. Uh it's very much um the off season and working through the off season is part of our culture. Uh, you know, it's where the off season is just a time that we use to train rookies to learn new things. That's just kind of how it is, uh, for our team at least. So, and I imagine that's the case for many other FTC teams. Um, if there's a specific issue, there might there might need to be a little bit more personalized uh, addressing of that. Uh, but yeah, just sort of, it's just kind of what we do. I will add to that of um, making it fun is a big part of it, but also making sure your team understands the purpose of outreach. Um, we mentioned a little bit earlier that some of the awards, like the motivate and connect awards really feed are from based on the outreach you're doing in your community and with professionals and things like that. Um, and having time over the summer when you're not trying to build a robot and really focused on that to get these things done makes your competition season a little bit less stressful because you're not trying to pack all the things in for that. But um, making it fun is a big part of it. I mean, we've mentioned some of the things in the community they do, different festivals and things like that. But you know, in times we've gone to like the Ohio State Fair and it's just a fun day all around where you're demoing your robots, but you're also getting to explore the fair and have fun, things like that. So that's how we try to motivate people 
to, um, you know, stay involved and come to as many events as they're available for. Um, obviously you have vacations and all kinds of things to work around, but that's kind of our focus and understand the purpose and keep it fun. Very much so. You know, and also plan. if all else Thanks fails, snacks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Snacks, yes. <laughs> um, I think laying out the expectations um, for rookies and for, for people coming into the program um, helps as well. I mean, I don't think that any of the kids come in without fully understanding, you know, the, as Jamie put it, the culture of our team. Um, and it's just in the DNA of uh, 10, 4, 6, 4 to, to um, be out there in the community and doing the outreach um, and, and just the, the fact that we, you know, as a team feel that that's an important part of the program. All right. Do we have any more questions from anybody? And for those who ask questions, did your questions get answered or do you have any follow-ups? Absolutely. Feel free to ask follow-up questions at any time. All right, so next we will be talking about professional outreach. Professional outreach is a really awesome way to gain experience from professionals, um, also gain connections that will ben that could benefit you in your future career, and also market yourself to judges for different awards. So how exactly do you find professionals connect to connect with? Um, I'd say one of the easiest ones is mentor and parent connections. Maybe one of the members on your team has a parent who may work for a tech company or a mentor may work for a tech company, reach out to them and kind of get in contact with them and arrange a visit. You can contact local businesses, especially tech companies. They're always willing to help out with a robotics team and also look for opportunities offered by companies to public or first teams. I believe we have a list that we can send out later of different publicly sponsored, like things sort of like grants that we can send out that you guys can apply for and those will help you get sponsorships and connect with professionals. Um, professionals can cover all the different bases of robotics so business and marketing skills how to brand yourself how to market yourself to judges and other teams engineering design cat and design insight all that good build stuff and programming um more complex algorithms and equations how to understand them how to write them So obviously it's important to plan for any sort of event, but it's especially important, I think, to plan for a professional outreach event. You really wanna make sure you set your intentions. You wanna know what you wanna talk about, know what you wanna view, want everything. Know your intentions for the event so you can get the most out of it, gain the most from that experience. Know the company, obviously, the more STEM experience a company has, the better. Plan your objectives. Like I said earlier, set your intentions. You could tour their facility. You could give a presentation on your team or robot and get advice or feedback. And obviously be prepared to talk about first in your team. I found that companies, professional companies really love to hear about first and your, your experience in robotics and they'll ask a lot of questions about it. So just be prepared to talk about that. So here are some examples of things you may wanna consider doing during a professional outreach event. So educate professionals about first in your team. Obviously, like I said, they love to talk about first on your team. So be prepared to talk about your kind of journey in robotics as a person or as a team as a whole. Ask companies to present on what they do, getting some insight in what your future could look like if you wanna continue with robotics is always really, really interesting. And practice your judging presentation with professionals. In FTC, a lot of the judge, the judges, um, or the judges, they come from a professional background in um, usually programming or like some sort of STEM background. So having so having someone with similar background judge you on your presentation can be really, really useful and kind of help you get an idea of what judging may be like before you even get that opportunity. Um, professional feedback getting professional feedback is always a really, really awesome opportunity. So you could hold a design review with a company to get some feedback on the design of your robot. 
You could also get strategy on your market. You could get feedback on your marketing strategy and you could also get feedback on your team's presentation like I mentioned earlier. Um, and here are some more examples of things you could do during a professional outreach event, touring the workspaces, obviously getting to just see, touring the facility of any sort of professional workspace is really cool. But I find especially with like a lot of the manufacturing companies, it's just really neat to see these big machines and how they work. And sometimes you can even find yourself inspired for how you want to build your robot after seeing some of these mechanisms and machines. Uh, college campus tour, colleges really love it when you're involved in robotics. So they'll try it. They, you can reach out to them or sometimes they'll even reach out to you and you get to tour their campus, but also learn about robotics opportunities in the future. And you can also in, uh, invite professionals to attend a meeting. Um, if you see the picture over there, that is a that is um, someone who works in plastics and he came to one of our meetings and he taught, taught us about all different types of plastics and their properties and how we could use them on our robot. And that was um, really useful and we were able to kind of form like a connection with him and now he can provide us with plastics if needed. Um, you can also get mentorship and invite professionals to mentor your team. Those that's, I'd say that's like one of the most valuable things you can gain from professional outreach. Having just someone there to like, with all this knowledge just at your disposal is incredibly important and powerful. They can help you learn programming and engineering skills, marketing skills, pretty much anything. It's really awesome. And question break. All right, uh, someone had a question about, uh, to give an example about how we reached out to a com company like Forvia? Uh, we actually, with Forvia, one of our uh, then team members, now alumni, uh, his mother uh, worked for Forvia. Um, so she was able to get us a time slot to come in and tour. That's actually how we get a lot of our, at least tours of workspaces, will be that a team member or a mentor or someone directly connected to the team has a connection at an event, uh, not at an event, at a company um, that we are able to then go and tour or um, give them a presentation about FTC and how that works. So I would recommend when you're starting with professional outreach, uh, start close to home and work with connections that you already may have. Um, and then you can kind of start to branch out uh, once you've got a little bit more of an identity. Uh, another thing that we've done in the past, like in the pre-COVID years, would be um, sometimes companies will have on their websites ways to set up a tour. And you can, like if you have a local auto manufacturer or something like that around, uh, they may do that kind of thing. And you can go ahead and register uh, through that um, and try and set up your team with a tour and then get to know the people doing the tour. So you might be able to make uh, stronger uh, relationships with them as time goes on. Absolutely. Uh, number one tip when it comes to setting up outreach is don't be afraid to send an email. Uh, you know, the worst they can say is no. Just make sure you are reaching out to any company that you have an interest in, uh, because ch chances are um, they they very well may give you a tour. Com companies, tech companies, uh, manufacturing companies love to see kids in robotics. Any other questions? First outreach means a lot and is a major part of what makes first first. Interacting with other teams and levels of first is something that everyone should be doing. There are many different types of first outreach that a team can do. The simplest form of first outreach is talking and interacting with other FTC teams at events. But if you want to go a step beyond, you can start an FLL team and make materials to share with other teams or even host events for the first community, such as a kickoff, scrimmage, or workshop, which can expose your team and anything you learned and expand your network.
Forming a network of teams that you can talk to and ask for help is an important part of FTC. If you're struggling with something bill-related, then you should always have someone you can ask for help. Information is available almost everywhere, such as the FTC Discord and at other events, such as the so on. How you design your pit space is important too. Pit spaces help judges and other teams see your brand and can show ideas of your team off. Pit boards should be used to show your journey throughout the season. Your pit boards can include your build process and ideas, cool things you programmed this season, such as your auto, and any outreach events that you hosted. The pit area is a space to connect with other teams and demonstrate your experience. A few examples of outreach includes hosting scrimmages, building a social media presence, whether this is Discord or something else, asking answers to questions, or asking or answering questions, and hosting or attending something like this workshop. Um, I'll open it up to any questions now. We have a question about how to present your team in a way that can let you get a sponsorship of a company. So that uh, can depend a lot on both your team and the company. Uh, generally, if we're talking about uh, tech companies and companies that may be related to robotics as a whole, uh, it's a great idea to sort of emphasize the professional and industry standards skill that you're learning and using through first. Uh, you know, it's okay if you don't have a whole lot of presentation experience, just make sure you're practicing a lot. Uh, the main thing is that you want to be as professional as possible, make sure that you know what you're talking about, and make sure that you are staying focused and on task the whole time. Just, uh, you know, sort of that, that professional presentation is something that leaves a, a good taste in people's mouths and allows you to have that, that good first impression. And then, like I said, focus on real world applicable skills that you're learning uh, in first. I, I would One add to that course. sharing some of the uh, information on your expected cost for the seasons, kind of a estimated budget and kind of what your resources are and how you're trying to um, make money to support your team. So just that's valuable information to share with potential sponsors, just kind of so they understand the need and why you're asking. Um, we put together like a little pamphlet that kind of gives information about our team and our budget and fundraising and different things we do throughout the year to share with sponsors. One other point that I know is uh, useful in the United States, I'm not sure about other countries, is if you have the ability to be a um, funnel money or have money come through a charitable organization. We do here in Loveland, we've set that up. Uh, and what that allows companies to do is their contributions, their sponsorship can be done as a, uh, a charitable expense in their business. Which makes their uh, taxes cost less. So they yes. get taxes. Helps, helps with taxes. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Another question on, can you talk more about your pit boards and why you should use them? Absolutely. So pit boards um, can look different for every team. Not every team has them, uh, but they are a great thing to be able to present kind of your team. Uh, so for us, that just looks like a couple of trifolds. Uh, we put up pictures, words, all, all sorts of documentation from throughout our season. Uh, and we mainly use them for pit judging. Uh, so when you're at a competition, judges will be walking around in the pit area, uh, and you can use that to show pictures, graphs, uh, various data from when you have been working throughout the season. Uh, and it's just a great way to have a visual aid for judging. But also, if you happen to be talking with another team about part of your robot or an algorithm that you wrote or something like that, if you have it posted on your pit board, it's a good way to sort of 
again, use as a visual aid to get people to kind of better understand the points that you're making. And from a less content, more aesthetic uh, standpoint, they make your pit they make your pit area look quite nice, um, as you can see in our background there. One final point I would add about first outreach is it's probably the most important type of outreach of really connecting to other first teams. Um, whether you're mentoring younger teams like FLL or um, connecting with other FTC teams as part of events or at events, um, it offers you the greatest opportunity to learn from other teams, but also do things that the judges will recognize, you know, if you're trying to contend for awards thing of that you're having an impact and helping other programs do their best um, in first as well. So. We do a lot of our team members will mentor um, FLL teams in the area. And that's typically like going to a one meeting a week, you know, and just kind of um, being there as another person to help out. But in a lot of cases, our team members were on, did FLL at some point. So they have some knowledge of it as well. And particularly when you have rookie coaches for FLL teams that have never done it before, it's a super valuable resource for them. So just having that robotics experience to share with different age groups is really important. Hi. Hello. I have a question that why is the right definition of outreach in FTC? It means helping others in STEM and technical things or uh, things like cleaning the ocean or helping poor people, something like that. Uh, so outreach and FTC is generally uh, focused on robotics, um, either teaching or learning about STEM and professional skills. Uh, so, you know, there's no reason that your team shouldn't go out and do things like, you know, charity, environmental work, uh, but that won't be as important in the judging room and isn't generally what outreach is focused on in FIRST. All right, if there aren't any more questions, we'll go ahead and move on to the sponsorship portion of this. So we'll be talking about sponsorships, how to get them, what they look like, et cetera. So sponsorships don't necessarily have to be monetary. I know when you think, when I first joined first, all I thought that sponsorships was were us just getting money from different companies. But sponsorships can be a lot of different things. For example, we can have material sponsorships. This is where companies or people will give you material goods or services that they may provide. Um, materials can be for the robot or for the team. For example, CAD software. We use a program called SolidWorks and SolidWorks isn't usually free, but we have a sponsorship from them that allows us to get it for free. And it's a very industry kind of value. It's a very valued tool in like the professional world. So it helps us look good to the judges, but it also helps us gain like some professional skills that we may use when we're older. Um, companies can also manufacture or donate certain parts to you. Um, your robot obviously doesn't have to be made completely of pre-manufactured parts. So um, if, if you, and it's often hard to get some of these like custom parts. So having a company manufacture them for you can be very useful. Um, also things such as um, motors, servos, um, sensors, or cameras, they're often pretty expensive. So companies can donate parts or donate those to you. Um, they can also provide resources for community outreach. And this, a good example I'd like to use of this is we host a thing called Breakfast with the Bots, which is for our community. Everyone just comes in and we make a pancake breakfast, but we also demonstrate our robot and stuff. And as you can imagine, it's pretty expensive to get um, breakfast for like hundreds of people. So we have a deal with one of our sponsors and they give us um, bacon for the event, which is usually a pretty popular item. And it also saves a lot of money having that provided by a sponsor. And obviously there are monetary sponsorships, which are just as valuable as any other type of sponsorship. And companies can offer these in several different ways. Um, first, there's grant programs. Um, like I said, we have a document of grant programs of for, through FIRST and just throughout 
Oh yeah, it just got sent in the chat. So there's a list of grants available to FTC teams. These are off, always really, really useful. And a lot of times these are done through companies. So kind of getting these grants, applying for them, talking with the companies is really good professional outreach too. Direct donations, those are always really, really useful and help a lot. That's probably, that if you see there, there's a big check that we got, one of the big comical large check. That's a direct donation. That's very, very useful and helped our team a lot. Matching funds, that's always incredibly generous and always appreciated. And assistance in covering team expenses. Expenses. So if you're new to FTC, you might not know yet, but FTC is pretty expensive. Things like even going to a tournament, registering for it can cost a lot of money. And just even like um, assistance in covering these sort of like expenses that you may otherwise brush aside it are it's very, very useful and very, very appreciated in the world. Um, and intellectual sponsorships. So this is kind of like having almost like a mentor on your team. This is where companies share their professional expertise and they um, they can come visit you or they can do like a Zoom meeting or something and they can offer you feedback on your team as a whole and your robot. They can give you marketing feedback. Um, they can give you um, robot feedback, like programming feedback, just feedback on pretty much anything. Just having someone who's been in an industry a long time and having them kind of at your disposal to like ask about certain things, get advice, get... Um, recommendations, any sort of thing. It's incredibly useful and it's, don't brush it aside. And of course, how to find sponsorships. Finding sponsorships is pretty similar to finding, um, finding professional connections. So obviously for start small, look at your mentors, look at your parent connections. If someone's got like a direct, direct, direct connection, to a company, um, then you can talk to them, arrange a visit, um, arrange a talk with one of them to talk about sponsorships, contact local businesses. Any sort of business always loves to um, sponsor uh, young robotics team teenagers, but especially if it's a tech company, they they kind of see themselves in you and they're like, well, we want to sponsor them. like. And yeah, um, and of course, look for grant programs and nonprofits. Again, that link is available in the chat and you can use that to kind of apply for different grants, which will provide you with a lot of spot, like sponsorship opportunities. And any questions? We have one about the, what's the number for the sponsor that gives you the bacon? Uh, that one, I believe, is still Sugar Creek Foods. Yeah, it is. You may have trouble getting free bacon, though, if you're not running an event. Uh, so you may have to organize a whole pancake breakfast. I don't know. I would recommend it, though. That's one of our most popular events, and it's really fun for everyone involved. One other thing that happens over time, this isn't right away, but happens over time, and maybe you can talk about it when you start working with a company or doing anything like that, is these the kids who are involved in um, uh, robotics are sharp. They're really smart kids. And so we've had numerous um, active students and alumni who have gone and done internships with some of our sponsors over time. So there becomes that, uh, you know, co, you know, working together kind of thing. So, hey, provide us with some uh, uh, sponsorship money. And then we have uh, some of our students who learn through the program, then bring some of their skills to the business uh, for them in the future. Yeah, just being in robotics is such an awesome opportunity. You just get to if just with the professional outreach, you meet so many people, you can kind of get a taste of what if you continue with a robotics based career, or some like a professional career, like the person that you're visiting. Um, it's you can kind of get a taste of what it could be like to work for one of those companies or just be in that field. And it's I it's it's just such a useful opportunity. I it's awesome. 
Absolutely. We have several alumni who work uh, full time now uh, who've been out of college and now work for companies that sponsor us. So that is it's a great opportunity for everyone involved. Looks like we do have one more question in the chat that I'll handle real fast. Um, do you get a sponsorship from a big tech company like Microsoft? Uh, we personally, I don't believe, have any quite that recognizable. Uh, but there are definitely teams who get sponsorships from huge companies. When we were at Worlds in 2022, um, there was a company that had a sponsorship from Google. Uh, so it it kind of depends on where you are. If you're near headquarters or corporate buildings for big tech companies, absolutely go for it. Um, but it's not necessary. You know, you can get several sponsorships from smaller companies um, and, you know, it, it, it very much depends on your needs. Is the team on Facebook? I believe we are actually. Yes. Um, yes. I don't know what that username is off the top of my head, but it's some variation of Bionic Tigers. I'm sure of that. Um, so yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to contact us at any of these addresses here, any of our social media, uh, probably not Twitter. We're not on there a whole lot. Um, email would be best, but we are happy to answer any more questions that you may have. Um, so we will let you guys go. If you got places to go for our Moroccan friends, uh, get some sleep. They have a question. We do. We do have one more question. Oh, there is the another chat. question. Okay. Sponsors in other countries like USA. Um, Honestly, I would say start by reaching out through email. Um, that's always, you know, company emails are generally the most monitored form of social media. Um, so reach out from your, if you have a team email account, reach out through there um, and then outline specifically what it is that you need. Um, so, you know, lead off with, we are, you know, a robotics team. Uh, these are the things that we need. Here's why you should help us. Um, but yeah, email email is definitely the best way to reach out to te uh, to companies that don't have a local presence near you. Yep. And when you reach out, uh, use not just robotics, but first robotics. First is yes. a globally recognized program. Very much so. Yes. All right. Well, like I said, uh, thank you all. Have a good rest of your day night morning afternoon evening week weekend not weekend it's not it's the same day for everybody um but yeah uh thank you for coming feel free to contact us we are glad to have you all